ahead, please. Right, so you said, like you said, uh, this is an issue that comes up a lot and something that you see often. We want to do this story about uh, H-1B employees who sign bonds and regret it. Um, it seems like a lot of people. Um, and I just wanted to know in general what your perspective was and if you've seen these cases, if you've dealt with clients with, uh, who've gone into legal fights with employers over this. We've been dealing with these issues consistently and constantly for many, many years. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a little difficult topic to get our hands around because it's a complicated issue. First of all, there are two kinds of situations. One situation is sometimes employees sign quote-unquote bonds for continued employment in their home countries. That is a lot more complicated than situations where they have signed quote-unquote bonds for continued employment in the United mm -hmm. States. So if it is in a country other than the USA, our discussion would have to be very different because a lot depends upon the law of the country that we are talking about. I always advise people, and mostly I actually get contacted by other lawyers who are, who are defending the employees who are getting sued or who are being threatened to be sued. So if it is a country other than the United States, normally what I advise is that lawyers should argue that U.S. laws disfavor these types of prohibitive contracts and because most nations will follow unless there is something so repugnant in the laws of the United Nation, I'm sorry, United States that it it, it, it would be unconscionable for them to follow. They will follow U.S. policies in this, refer in this regard. So you could always state that the job was to be performed in the United States. This contract should be interpreted according to the laws of the United States. This is also called conflict of laws. So that's one angle. If you get sued in your home country, have your lawyers contact us or somebody else who's familiar with this issue. Number one. Number two, if you get sued in the United States or if you um, signed a bond in the United States, there are a couple of things that are problematic. First of all, in the US laws, because contracts are a matter of state law, unlike India, India has yeah. uniform laws for contracts all over the country. In the United States, there are 50 states and 50 different sets of laws. They might be very close with each other. Most of them are built upon common law, mm -hmm. which is the British law, but there are still variations. But as a generic rule, Contracts in restriction of employment are disfavored even by courts. So th there is the angle of state law. Most states will allow you to have what is referred to as liquidated damages. Liquidated damages is what is in the common parlance referred to as a bond. And I have a couple of articles on that on our website. Um, I, I've written, yeah. written two very lengthy articles on this. So they can, but they were meant for other lawyers, so they tend to get a little legal. But the bottom line is that liquidated damages clauses are permissible, but penalties are not permissible. What is the difference between the two? A liquidated damages clause is designed to protect the employer in case of an employee leaving without fulfilling contractual obligations. So it's a protective clause. Whereas 
a penalty clause is a weapon of offense. It is meant to hurt the employee if they right. leave employment. And what is the difference between the two? One is reasonable, the other one is unreasonable. There's a whole slew of law on how reasonable, unreasonable works. I don't know what length you want us to get into that, but I'll I'll leave it for here and you can do follow up questions after this. So if it yeah. is if it is unreasonable, it's it's likely to create a lot more problems for the employer than for the employee. And I'll explain to you how that is. Okay. Under the now we are dealing with state law. Now let us shift to US federal laws. And whenever there's a conflict between state law and federal law, federal law prevails. Federal law says US Department of Labor has the authority to ascertain whether a clause in a contract is a liquidated damages clause, genuine defensive clause, or whether it operates as a penalty, in which case employer can be reprimanded and sanctioned by the US Department of Labor. But I have pointed that out earlier in an opinion piece that it's troublesome to have the Department of Labor enter your premises as the employer because there's a whole slew of other things they can start looking at and it becomes quite quite difficult for the company to deal with it. So yeah. the issue of what is allowed and what is not allowed itself can trigger some substantial investigations. Okay. A lot of employees don't know that and employees lawyers don't know that. As in India now, as all over the world, what happens is lawyers tend to get pigeonholed in their own practice areas. Mm -hmm. If you are a contracts lawyer, you only do contracts, you don't step beyond your area. You will know, of course, most of the things that impinge upon your area, but you will not never have the vertical expertise of somebody who practices, somebody like me who does immigration law uh, or yeah. employment-based immigration law. But my background is in very many different bodies of the law, including contract law, corporate law, international, private international law, um, constitutional law. So I've dealt with many different things and that gives you a certain perspective which is missing these days because we are so pigeonholed in our own practice areas. Lawyers so don't... Let, let, me, misconceptions. let me finish this thought and I will... Okay. I will my, my thought was this, that that forewarned is forearmed. When lawyers who are defending employees who are getting sued or about to be sued understand the power an employee has, it, things become different. Yeah. In, in fact, employees have a lot of power. They can challenge a lot of things that the employers are doing. There are some cases on the books where em employees have consistently lost these cases and in all those cases that have been lost, I have seen that the this issue of what is permissible under US federal law was never argued, simply because the lawyers defending these folks were not aware of the law. So to go back to your question, this lays the foundation of how the laws operate. I will summarize very briefly okay. factors that count in the determination of how strong the quote unquote the bond is, we look at whether it is a bond in your home country or the United States. If it is in the home country, you argue public policy. If it is in the United States, you have to look at whether the contract is indeed a penalty or a defensive liquidated damages clause. Mm -hmm. Then Remember that the Department of Labor has, I would say, even the obligation, not just the right, to determine whether a clause is a penalty or permissible liquidity damages. So that, in a nutshell, is the structure. Please go ahead with your questions. Okay, yeah, no, that was, that was really informative. Um, so if someone signs in their home country, can the company uh, affect 
their activities in the U.S. at all, or is that taken to a court in, say, in India? I have seen a very sleazy practice. And actually, I, I did help somebody find, find counsel in India to defend that. What, what this company was doing was, it's a large company. They were, not only were they making the employees sign promissory notes, they were leveraging the promissory notes against the property owned by the employee. So, so it depends upon what kind of bond has been drawn. And you should definitely have your lawyers contact proper appropriate counsel including us to determine what is the best thing to do we can certainly guide and provide the laws in the united states for supporting your case in your home country okay and what are some of the biggest misconceptions you've come across when people are dealing with such cases i want to point one thing out there is a difference okay. between actual damages and damages that are contemplated under a bond. Now, this is something, it's a fine distinction, but it's a world of difference. Yeah. Let us say, I, I promise that I'll work with you and I'll work for your company and I'll finish my project. We signed, there are two possible situations. We signed a quote unquote bond for $10,000 and I quit before performing you sued me for 10,000. That's where all our discussion comes in. Is it a penalty? Is it permissible? Now examine another situation. Instead of suing me on the contract, you sue me for actual damages. You, sue, you say, look, because you walked away, I lost the project. I suffered an expense of $40,000 uh, on the project or $200,000 or a million dollars on the project. Or, yeah. To replace you, I had to spend $70,000. Now you owe me that money. That's called actual damages. There is never any prohibition against suing an employee for actual damages. Keep that in right. mind. Uh, so we have to separate the two, actual and penalty type damages. Actual damages can always be sued upon. Now, what was your original question? I lost track of that. Could you re repeat that? Uh, just what the misconceptions are yes uh, when you're dealing with right employees. right thank you so the first misconception is that employees have no power employees actually yeah. have a lot of power the second misconception is the one that i described to you which is you can always be sued for damages that you actually caused but you when you get sued for a predetermined amount such as a penalty amount there you have all sorts of defenses that may not be commonly known so that's the second yeah. thing the third thing is and this could be a part of a more generic h1b type discussion mm -hmm. but the balance of power has shifted tremendously in favor of the employees if an employee is not getting paid if an employee is getting targeted if an employee is not getting paid according to the promised amounts they can pick up the phone and register a complaint with the wage and hour division of the u.s department of labor they will always i don't know of any case where they've not investigated an employee's complaint and if yeah. if money is owed to you they will collect your money and give it to you you don't have to spend a dollar on that so that is not a, so much a misconception, but it is a, an underestimation of your own power. One telephone from you can bring down a company if they are doing things incorrectly or illegally. So employees are in a much more powerful position than employers are in this respect. Okay, in your experience, have, is that when... Um people tend to leave these companies is when they're being mistreated and then they get stuck with the bond? I think there is a problem on both sides. There are yeah. bad employees and bad employers. I right. consider an employee to be bad if they don't live up to their commitment. And similarly, I consider an employer to be bad if they exploit or exploit their employees or don't live up to their commitments. So there are problems on both sides. 
But I will tell you this. In the last five years, I have seen employees get more and more aware and more and more alert about their rights. And I see a far fewer instances where we can say that companies are getting away with exploitative behavior. Another thing is, beginning January 17th, a certain set of regulations was enacted which actually protects an employee who wants to leave a lot more. For example, you have 60 days grace period to find another job. It didn't yeah. used to be there. Secondly, if you leave, much of your benefits of the green card go with you. So you're not losing any time or any, any time on your career or your green card. So I think the employees are in a much better position today than they were five years ago. Yeah, well that's good to remember. Uh, but if you had to, in your experience, are these usually companies that deal with consulting or outsourcing that tend to have this bond in place or these sort of contracts? Yes, so yes, yes and no. Because there are companies who have, for instance, an in-house project or they are developing their product and they in usual just have let's say a policy of getting liquidity damages clauses in their contracts not realizing that these are these could be problematic for the company so it could it could be either way any company that we have been in touch with we have always discussed with them their liquidated damages clauses, made sure that they are reasonable, that they are being used for protection, not for prohibition. So in my view, it can be any company. Some of it is basically ignorance of the law. Actually, most of it is ignorance of the law. Yeah. I, the, uh, oh, well, lost my track. Uh, I, I want to make one more point while you think of your next question you had sent me an email yeah. i can always pull pull your email if you want but oh, no, I have it up. but here is a very interesting situation let me mm -hmm. let me go back yes normally employers are not allowed to pass on their normal business expenses to the employees directly or indirectly that's another argument lawyers should be making by trying to collect the amount you spent on my h1 you are committing an illegal act. So they should never sue you for money that they spent on the H1. That's Can another... they sue you for air tickets and like a house or any kind of legal expenses that they had? We have to make a distinction between what is the normal business expense for an employer and what is okay. not. For instance, if the employer has a policy of paying for the air tickets of their employees, that's their normal business expense, right? Yeah. They can't sue me for that. But if they don't usually do that and they made an accommodation for me, they could probably sue me for that. Oh, so they have to show that that's not a part of their regular policy. Actually, it, would, it is more a job of the defense counsel to prove, uh, okay. the, the defendant's okay. counsel, I should say, to prove that they are, that the expenses are the ordinary business expenses. Okay, so that's one strategy to go about with. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I came across so many people who had dealt with these issues with the bonds and people who had very knowingly signed these contracts and um, sort of instantly regretted it a year later. Do you know why this is taking place? Is it because they overestimate the amount they'll be earning or they overestimate the experience they'll have with the company and don't expect to leave? I would not try to second guess the mind of so many diverse people, but I can I can take a take an educated guess at why people would be doing it. Mm -hmm. I have always maintained for for people from India and many countries in Europe the primary attraction of the United States is not economic as much as it is lifestyle. Yeah. USA has a better lifestyle than almost any other country that I have lived in so far. So 
when people come to the United States, one of the motivations is lifestyle. Some of them are economic. Some of them are opportunities. Now, when people weigh that against the amount of money they would be giving away, in balance, they feel that the amount is worth it. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah. Are there any red flags that they should that should come up when they're looking at a contract? Something that should jump out at them that this is an employer that they probably shouldn't be dealing with? Any employer who asks you to pay any money up front, get away from yeah. them as fast as you can because chances are they are a sleazy employer. If they are going to break the law, they are going to break the law to hurt you as well. So never, ever, ever, ever go with an employer who asks you to pay any money. Okay. Um, yeah, and I wanted to ask you if employers can withhold uh, wages when they are suing you. On, um, on an... On an H-1B, that is a complete no-no. That is an okay. independent ground of a complaint. So you can, there are very strict rules. This is a very highly choreographed area of law. When yeah. you want to deduct wages, they can only be deducted for the convenience of the employee at the written request of the employee. So for instance, if the employee says, can you please take my health insurance costs directly from the paycheck, yeah. you can do that. But let's say the employee owes you $20,000 and his last paycheck is $7,000. You should write the entire check out as an employer. Don't try to hold any money back from the paycheck. You can sue separately, but no money should ever be withheld. If an employee's money is withheld, call the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor. They'll fix it. Yeah, I think I think those that covered most of my questions. Can you send me a link to your opinion pieces, or are they on the website? They are on our website. If you go to okay. if you go to immigration dot com okay. and go to about us, we have a lot of stuff about what the firm has done, firm in the news, firm in the media, and then there's an there's a entry about articles written by Rajiv. So if you go in there, you'll find all my articles. Okay, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll if I have any follow-up questions, can I email you and you can just respond by email just in case if I have any doubts. Of course, I'll um, be I'll be happy to. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks thanks so much for your time. Um, You're very welcome. Know, let me stop I know the. It was hard for me. Let me stop the recording for a moment.